Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. And welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we're welcoming back one of my favorite guests. See, you're a favorite guest, Alan Minoff, who is a uh, uh, who, who is a private investor in stocks and bonds. Even though we may not be talking about stocks and bonds, he knows a lot of politics, and we're going to be talking about divided America. Part two. Part one, of course, was with Ron Montagna, and he was more on the Democratic side. And today we have another side, the Republican side point of view. And I want to welcome you again, Alan. Great to have you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for inviting yes, me. Yes, yes. And I just want to thank the Bluegrass Restaurant for having us today. And uh, we always enjoy our meal there. And I get a lot of information from Alan by eating together. So again, thank you, Alan, for coming on the show. Um, we want to start with some of the things that we've been hearing in the news. And one of them is back to the impeachment future. And Democrats are speaking of contempt, citations, subpoenas, executive privilege, hearings, and are the, are the Democrats getting closer to impeachment in this country? And why are they doing it? Because um, uh, people right now, they want to they talk about infrastructure. They want to they get away from all these things. We had the Mueller investigation for, what, almost how many months? Or 30 months. 30 months. 30 and, months, $30 million, I believe. 30, of, our, wow. of, our, of taxpayer dollars. OK, we paid this guy $30 million. And he, all he said was there was no collusion and no, uh, no, no, no collusion by the Trump administration or the Russians or whatever. Didn't say the Russians were innocent. Just said there was. Oh, just the uh, Trump administration did not okay. collude with the Russians. Okay. To th about anything to do with yeah, the two. Yeah, the Russians could have been election. not innocent, but um, but anyway, they want to start again with impeachment, and the people are kind of tired of this. I'm not just talking about Republicans; I'm talking about Democrats as well. I hear it all the time. We're in a um, a current event roundtable discussion group together, and I know you have your own one in Wilmette, and mine, of course, is in Highwood, and I think the people are getting tired of it. What's going on, Alan? Why impeachment after the, after the Mueller investigation, where it showed there was no, you know, collusion? How, and how do you impeach somebody? You have to, they have to be a criminal to impeach, so let's talk about it. Well, my feeling is that the Democratic Party, certainly the leadership of the Democratic Party, the failed candidate from 2016 never reconciled themselves to the fact that they lost the 2016 election. They were so sure that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to be the president. And every poll, 99% of the polls, the day before Election Day, said that Hillary Clinton was going to win. It was and like Dewey, right? And the Truman. Well, was like, um, sort of. Because yeah, they already had like the headlines. Were, they had the headlines. Yeah. Um, but, and she won the popular vote, but that's not how we select the president. We select the president according to the Electoral College as provided for by the Constitution, and um, uh, president Donald Trump won the presidency. And I don't think psychologically that the Democratic Party has reconciled themselves to that fact. So they, uh, certainly some of them, uh, Nadler being a prominent example, has not accepted that Trump is the president. Now, it's only uh, what, a year and a half before we get another election. And this is what should be, this is the kind of issue that should be decided at the ballot box. That's why we have elections. 
Um, even though one team is highly favored in a sporting event, you still play the game and let's see what happens. So we're going to have another, they're going to get another bite at the apple next year in November. And we'll see, we may get a new president or we may not. But uh, Nadler is not, is not going to give up and he will, regardless, He's of the, regardless of the fact that the Constitution provides relatively undefined that impeachment is for high crimes and misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It, it, a lot of interpretations are available what that means. But um, there's no evidence that uh, Trump, like him or not like him, has done anything to justify impeachment under high crimes and misdemeanors. And for sure, the Senate, currently controlled by the Republicans, and also which requires, I believe, a two-thirds majority for impeachment, is not going to impeach the president. And so and this and is and just also, a waste of time. And also the Russians have been, I mean, in the Obama administrations, the, Ru the Russians kind of creeped in. Uh, in. In all the elections we've had, we've had other countries trying to, you know, mooch in, uh, into our elections. It wasn't the Russians, it was the, the Chinese. It was so many different people. And, you know, uh, I mean, that's, I mean that, the whole idea of this, the, of the, um, it started with the FISA warrant, and it was all about, supposedly, about Russia, and nothing was ever found about Russia at this point. What was the, you know, the FISA, in fact, there, it was all about uh, Christopher Steele putting together this FISA warrant. Maybe you could uh, tell the viewers a little bit, what is the FISA warrant, what was, uh, who paid for it, what it was about, and how we got into the situation with Mueller in the first place. Well, the Russians did buy a few Facebook ads, but there's, mil there's millions and millions of Facebook ads. They bought a few Facebook ads. There's no evidence that a single vote in the United States was changed as a result of Russian influence. The FISA court was set up to provide for an intelligence investigation if uh, it was, could be sufficient evidence could be produced that an intelligence investigation was called for. Well, the evidence was never produced, but the, nevertheless, uh, the, the investigation was called for, uh, funded by, incidentally, the Hillary Clinton campaign under the Obama administration uh, to produce the dossier produced by Christopher Steele working for Fusion GPS um, with information, uh, alleged acts which were completely made up. There's no evidence that any of this ever happened. And it's notorious because some of them are, you know, really awful things that uh, uh, then private citizen Trump was alleged to have done uh, while in Moscow. Well, why didn't you, when, when uh, Mueller was, um investigating this whole thing why didn't he look at the source of the investigation which you're talking about with the uh the warrant and the uh christopher Steele and all the people that you talked about why wasn't he investigating i mean if he's going to be investigating uh president donald trump for uh, collusion with the Russians, how come he didn't, you know, in his mind, hey, where did all this info come from in the, the first place? His charter was very narrow. It did not include investigating the dossier, so he didn't investigate it. But there were so many things about the dossier that came out during his investigation. You would think he would be curious about it. Well, we used to have special prosecutors under a now expired statute. And a lot of mischief resulted as the result of having special prosecutors with a broad, broad mandate. So they could go and investigate all kinds of things different from what they had originally been charged with investigating. That's what he did. Well, that was not seen as a uh, appropriate use of uh, political power, or the, of the governmental investigation power. So that statute expired. And he had a very narrow mandate. He was not asked to investigate the FISA warrant, so he didn't do that. Yeah, but he, went, he was not asked to investigate uh, with the other three people that he, you know, that now they're in jail. That was Manafort and Cohen, uh, Cohen right. and, um, and uh, what was his name? He was the admiral, I mean, the uh, general. Uh, 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 um, the Irish gentleman. Uh, yes. Yes, former general. Uh, well, as it, it turns out, while they, they were, did plead guilty, I think they all pled guilty, I'm not sure of that, 
but they, I know Manafort did, he went and he got sentenced to jail. What they pleaded guilty, pled guilty for, had nothing to do with the campaign or with the Trump administration. Yeah. Manafort was convicted of acting on behalf of the Ukraine prior to the 2016 campaign yeah, and, and not registering as a foreign agent. And they had, had nothing, nothing to, to do with nothing it. Nothing to do with it. Right, they had nothing to do with it. Right. So he was investigating things that had nothing to do with the war in the beginning. That's what, I mean, the, the reason he, that, you know, they, they were investigating. And here they, and then they kept investigating all these different right. people and yet didn't investigate. The most important thing was how this, how this mandate and how this, started in the first place with the FISA, with the FISA warrant, or dossier as they call it. Well, unfortunately, it was not a particularly impartial investigation because Mueller and everybody on his staff were uh, Democratic operatives who hated Donald Trump. So they were looking very, 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 very hard to find something to pin on Trump. If Trump had used the wrong fork at a state dinner, mm -hmm that would have been cited as a presidential error. Uh, but they couldn't, you know, certainly with respect to collusion, they couldn't find anything. With the other half that they said, well, he, they couldn't exonerate him, which means clear him, but they said uh, we couldn't find anything that was a, that was a criminal. Just like in a, in, a, in a trial, the defendant is never found innocent. The defendant is found not guilty or not guilty. Yeah, and in, in fact, Alan Dershowitz just came on uh, and, and said a prosecutor, and Alan Dershowitz happens to be a Democrat, and he happens to uh, be a professor at Harvard University, or former, uh, former professor, I don't know, he may have just retired, and he said was that a prosecutor should never go beyond publicity uh, publicly to closing that there is insufficient evidence to indict. No responsible prosecutor should ever suggest that the subject of the investigation might be indeed guilty, even if there was insufficient evidence or other reasons not to indict. And that statement went well beyond his authority as special counsel and shows that he had a motive to help the Democrats here. Yes, well, the prosecutor's uh, job is not to render judgment. That's the jury's job if there's a trial or the House of Representatives, well, the House of Representatives indicts for impeachment. The Senate acts as the jury for impeachment. But Mueller took it upon himself to throw in all this extraneous precatory language, uh, giving his opinion, which was not part of his charge. Hmm. It's, it's interesting. And now, th because he said that, the, they, the Democrats feel that uh, now he's, you know, he was trying to tell them something since he couldn't indict because that's, he was just, uh, because he was just a prosecutor that now it's the Congress can do it. But when I heard his, I heard his speech and to me it didn't sound like that. How do they interpret that from his speech? I mean Mueller's, Mueller's, Mueller's short statement, Mueller's very short, short statement, statement and then said I'm going away right. five minutes I'm and, done. And I'm Goodbye. not taking any and questions. No, more qu no questions. No questions. How did they get out of a five-minute speech all this interpretation? Well, the, the two-pronged answer. The first answer is that in the 2018 election, the Democrats took control of the House. So it's not expected um, that there's going to be any significant legislative achievements through the 2020 presidential election. So nothing's going to happen the next two years. Some people see that as a plus. Uh, other people don't. And, you know, I guess if there are things that are truly necessary, flood relief when you know, Illinois has been so impacted by the floods, that isn't a really p very highly partisan issue. Everybody agrees that the flood relief should be done. But if there's anything that's partisan, nothing's going to happen. A and, and second of all, uh, with, with their control of the House, they have a bully pulpit that they can bring this endless stream of investigations to delegitimize the Trump presidency with the likelihood, and nothing is inevitable, but the likelihood he will be the Republican candidate in 2020, while the Democrats at the present time have 24 contenders. So it's kind of the flip of 2016, which was the, the, the opposite. But um, 
this, if, to the extent that Trump's presidency is delegitimatized, it makes him more vulnerable next year in the presidential election. Okay, so that so it's all being done for uh, political purposes. Political theater, yes. It's political theater that we're, we're hearing. So that's why nothing. And what about like you know, which is really happening right now, and they're not doing anything about it? Is the immigration? Uh, the laws need to be changed. Uh, it's it's it, all these. How many migrants from El Salvador, from uh, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Guatemala? Yeah, Central America. Central America. Yeah. How San many? Salvador. Oh my God! How many to this date do you think has arrived? Well, in May, in May, just last month, 110,000 people crossed the border, um, were detained. Most were quickly released and told to come back. And at the present time, this court for immigrants is backed up four or five years, uh, and then they're they can go, and they are. They are released. Uh, there, there are charities, the Catholic charities in particular, which bus them or fly them to cities and open the door and out they go. Will they show up? Most of them don't show up. I mean, it's a big country. It's so, like 315 right. million people. Well, where um, are we going to put everybody? Well, it's a I big mean, country. Most of it's empty, but uh, uh, w that's not the, the, the government doesn't put them anywhere. And in fact, in many states, certainly in California, um, uh, illegal immigrants get a medical care a free uh, they get in every state as far as I know the children get free education they show up at the public school they get educated um, they show up at a hospital uh, they're sick they get treated um, and so yet there's people, a lot of free stuff and yet people here I have a, so a family member that's on Medicaid right now who has a she has a, a daughter <clears throat> that's not you know that has lots of uh, problems and she has so many problems trying to get into a doctor that will take Medicaid. Yes. I mean, how are all these people going to get serviced by doctors when people here that have Medicaid, even people that are, are me, uh, that, that are on Medicare, you know, sometimes has to be, wait weeks to get seen by a doctor, and all of a sudden we have hundreds. Thousands, thousands of people thousands. coming here from all these these countries illegally bursting here in our seams and all of a sudden they're going to get taken care of before the people here in you know in our own country gets taken care of the legislation uh, promising Medicare and Medicaid and especially Obamacare from the last administration has made great promises that the facilities and the personnel with respect to medical personnel, doctors in particular, uh, there are not sufficient to meet. And the government doesn't guarantee that because you have a right to some services, if, if you're an illegal alien, that, nevertheless, that the government can necessarily provide. Now, with respect to public education, this is not the federal government which doesn't provide public education. This is local school districts. And children show up, they get to go to school, but wh where's the money come from? Uh, from the mostly property taxpayers. I mean, we, we, need, we need to start taking care of people in our country that are here as citizens. I know as a Medicaid patient myself, uh, my rheumatologist, he gives me between seven minutes to ten minutes. And one day he gave me uh, seven minute care, started walking out the door, and I said to the doctor, did you forget something? And he said, what did I forget? I said, you forgot to examine me. <laughs> I mean, this is the type of care that we're getting in the United States. What are they going to be doing with all these people that are coming in from, from the southern border, flocking here? If I'm getting seven minutes of care, where, what are they going to get? Well, in, in northern Illinois, which is where we happen to be, there are a relatively much, much smaller n number of illegal immigrants for sure, but immigrants in general. You go down into Arizona, Southern California, South Texas, much larger percentages, much larger numbers of, of uh, immigrants, both legal and illegal, are likely to show up at the local emergency room 
And I don't know how they're triaged and who gets taken care of first. Usually the sickest people get taken care of first. And they don't ask you for your immigration status. You're there. They take care of you. Interesting. So I don't know how they're going to be doing all this. You know, we're talking about Mexico. What do you, how do you feel um, when, when Donald Trump, our president, he put um, uh, tariffs, 5% uh, tariffs on Mexico until they take care of the situation at the border. And now uh, they said they will, and uh, I think the tariffs are now suspended. Um, how do you feel that worked out? Well, the tariffs never went into effect. Okay. Um, he made a, uh, a, a threat or a promise, mm -hmm. take it either way, uh, that this yesterday uh, he was going to institute 5% tariffs, starting at 5% and increasing 5% every month to 25% mm -hmm. on inter trade between the United States and Mexico, which is a huge trading partner. And there's many, many, many firms that have plants on the border on the Mexican side where uh, manufactured products are made. Uh, and a lot of that stuff goes back and forth across the border. Anyway, just before when he made that threat, this was posited as a terrible thing to do, was going to be a disaster. Uh, it was going to in interfere with the automobile manufacturer, manufacturers, a lot of which go back and forth across the border. Well, the day before, on Friday, a couple days before, Mexico sent a negotiating team up to Washington. And on Friday, basically, they agreed to do everything that the president asked them to do. Much better controls on their southern border, 1,000 miles from mm -hmm. the United States. Uh, much better controls on people going through Mexico. I mean, you see all the pictures of people on the trains and on top of right, the trains. Right. So the Mexican government has a lot of influence on what happens there. And and you think they're going to send some of these people back? What are they going to do with all the people well, in there? Well, to the extent that Mexico reinforces its southern border, uh, they sent 6,000 National Guard. They set up a National Guard, which they didn't have. And uh, the president of Mexico sent 6,000 National Guard troops down to the southern mm -hmm. border to prevent the problem in the first place. Because the people in Central America, a lot of them would like to live in the United States. <clears throat> Many, many, many people in the world would like to live in the United States. Uh, I'm prejudiced. I think this is the greatest country in the world. Yeah, but but we, can't, right. we can't accommodate. But look at all the people, Alan. Look at all the people that are waiting to come right. in legally. Years. For years. For years right. I mean, there, it's, like, it's like going to a, uh, going to see a movie that you've been wanting to see, and you're standing in line trying to get a ticket, and then people start cutting in right before you, and they get the ticket, and by the time you get to the box office, it's sold out. M many abuses. One is people jumping the line. Secondly, it turns out that uh, Rent-A-Kid is, is in effect, that many people will uh, rent out, basically, rent out a child, so they, you get special treatment if you have a family with children. But it turns out, with quick and inexpensive DNA tests, right. many of the families arriving on the border well, the child really isn't the child of the parents who present themselves right. as the parent. So that's immediately they get deported uh, because they didn't qualify a as a family. When they get deported, where do they send them? Where, does, where do we send the United States? Yeah, or Mexico. Well, Mexico agreed to take people back, and Mexico will, I don't know what Mexico is going to do, but I assume because 110000 a month, that's a million three people a year. That's not for yeah. a small tent camp on the other side of the border. Yeah, Send them back to whatever country they, they came, came from. from. Because Mexican, there are a lot of Mexican people, a lot of towns in Mexico where people are, you know, they're begging on the streets, they're, they're hungry, they don't have jobs. I mean, uh, we go to Puerto Vallarta and uh, there's so much uh, building going on. So people are employed and I don't see as many people on the streets begging very in fact every year that I go down there there's less and less begging because because there's so much construction going on and people are getting jobs all over the place it's one of the it's it's just booming Puerto Vallarta Mexico and uh, in that area but, but uh, there's other places in Mexico where people are very hungry so what are they going to do with all these people crossing the border they have trouble feeding their own people in many places well that's what the, that's the function of the the Mexican National Guard on their southern border to prevent the problem in the first place also 
international law, to the extent there is an international law, uh, provides that, the, that a, a somebody claiming asylum has to do it in the first safe country they get to. And the first safe country people from Central America get to is Mexico. Is Mexico. Yeah. So it's really Mexico's problem, not the United States. Yeah, so they have to, so they have to figure out what they're going to do with these people. And I mean, it just... I mean, I, I always felt that maybe we could go into their, you know, the United Nations. They should go into these countries and help the people out before they, you know, before they come out. Just help well, the situation in those countries so people don't try to burst out in the seams. And, you know, I mean, because look what's happening to so many families and children. And, I mean, along the way, there are, children are getting raped. Children are getting abused. Women are getting abused, abused, women are getting raped. I mean, all these horrible things when people start going into, you know, walking all these distances, you know, all these horrible things are happening to people. Well, it's clearly a situation. I mean, they're getting out of the country, excuse me, Ellen. They're getting out of the country because this is happening at home, but it's also happening when they start to leave their country on the roads and everything is just as bad. Well, just recently, the United States decided that gang violence in the country you came from and a, a poor economic situation in the country you came from does not constitute a well-founded fear of persecution. We have gang violence right here in Chicago, mm -hmm. in parts of Chicago and Illinois. So the United States has this problem as well. Uh, I don't know how much success you'd have as a refugee from the United States going somewhere else where you might like to live. <clears throat> yeah, like the people in and say, saying, uh, well, the there's West gang side violence Chicago. in America. Yeah. I, I want to be a refugee yeah. in, here in Switzerland yes. because you know the scenery is beautiful. I think you'd be on the next plane back. Yeah. Yeah, the other countries don't do that. No. I mean, people from the west side and south side of Chicago, where there is so much gun violence, mm -hmm. they could claim that too. Even though the vast majority of people on the west side and south side are innocent of doing anything, they don't, they don't do anything wrong, they're just trying to live their lives peacefully and, and stay out of the crossfire. Well, Alan, we're gonna, this is really interesting because we, we had the Democratic point of view last week and we're going to be hearing the, as we today, as the Republican point of view. And it's really, you know, everything is, uh, I think people kind of want the same thing, and yet nothing is being done. And that's in this country. And I think this is what I'm hearing. On